sorry. Please forgive me. I forgive you. I love you. This is the Hopa Ono prayer. And I've said this damn prayer more times than I could want to. <laughs> Basketball fans, NBA fans, who here is an NBA fan? Smitty was talking to me. Who, who here can tell me what's the average age of an NBA rookie, Smitty? 20, 21. I was 27 when I made the NBA. That was seven extra years of setbacks, heartaches, disappointments, seven years longer than my peers. That was hard. But these last three years of retiring from basketball, going through a divorce, being a single father, transitioning careers into a motivational speaker has been more difficult. And that's saying a lot. Because a key component of this transition was forgiveness. Transcending forgiveness. Even the old labels and definitions that we have of it. I'm going to walk you through some of these stories, and they are stories, that I have in my life. And sometimes we hold on to these stories, like merit badges because they give us an identity. So no matter how badly that hot coal burns, we still hold on to a story, unable to forgive and let it go. The reason why I have hearing loss is something called the RH factor. My mother was an O negative, I was an O positive. They didn't tell us to worry about RH factor because Jesus was coming again in the polygamous commune. And he didn't come. <laughs> and I was my mother's fifth child. When I was born, I was nearly dead, very yellow, lethargic, wasn't moving. And my mom, against the wisdom of our elders in this community in Pinesdale, Montana, took me out into Hamilton, Montana, population 1,000 people at the time, where there was a Johns Hopkins educated resident who specialized in RH because he was an RH baby himself. Dumb luck. He tested my liver bilirubin titer count, which was at the time a 45. To give you context, he says, okay, at 25, most babies have brain damage, 35, they're dead. Your son's a 45, I don't know why he's alive. There are two reasons why I'm alive. Because I chose to be, and there was someone there that helped me along the way. And this is a story that's a recurring theme throughout my life. I've had many tyrants and traitors on along my path, throw me under the bus and hurt me. But I've also had many people there to help me as well. And being able to ask and accept help is part of perseverance. And when I speak to corporations and schools, I get to tell them my little trendy tagline, which is the essence of leadership is perseverance. The essence of perseverance is grit. And the essence of grit is choice. Do you choose to get back up every single time you get knocked down? There is no magic wand, no cheat sheets, no time hacks, even though social media loves to tell us there are. No, it's not pretty. Perfection is not pretty. Learning to know who you are as you go along this journey of life. At the age of five, there are many th wonderful things about growing up in the polygamous commune in rural Montana, running around the wilderness with my 400 first cousins, <laughs> like Smurfs, wonderful. But there's also a dark side, and you learn to see these things through what we call pain. I had a Sunday school teacher at the age of five tell me that God had made me deaf as a form of punishment. And I even went and asked my grandmother if this was true, and my grandmother didn't really say no. And so I held on to the story. And that's the catch 22 of life. Our frontal lobe isn't fully developed until we're about 21, 22. And that's how we decipher fact from fiction. And yet we have to grow up with adults telling us what is truth, what is reality. And then when you're 18, they say, okay, go be an adult. And you're taking everything that you've learned at face value. 
And you're thinking, okay, this is truth. But then you keep stepping on landmines as you go through life and you're like, wait, this, these logics and these reasons and these principles don't apply to this scenario. What am I supposed to do with that? My parents actually got into a power struggle in Pinesdale, Montana. Because I'll give them a little kudos. I define this word called integrity. Lisa, what does integrity mean to you? With a mouthful of food, and I did that on purpose. What is your value? What do you choose? What do you hold true to you? And also, do you hold on to that? And so, no matter what other people are doing to you, my parents taught me this definition of integrity. In the all-red polygamous group, you would think that we're a socialist commune and everyone's treated equally, right? No. Socialism is a beautiful ideal that no one should want or need anything. Everyone has equal. But the reason why socialism doesn't work, I learned at a very young age, is that different people have different sets of work ethic and entitlement. But my parents, they treated everyone exactly the same. And so I learned to define integrity by this, by asking a question every single night before I go to bed. Was I the same person in every room that I walked into? Most of my leaders throughout my life, my basketball coaches, cannot answer yes to this question. Because when the cameras are on, they're Mr. Charming. But behind closed doors, they're a completely different person. And the saying goes, no man can serve two masters, and I add, especially if those two masters reside within the same psyche. How do you follow that? You said this yesterday, you said that yesterday, and even in religious figures, if you think about it, oh, well, revelation came today that said, oh, now I can do this, but I'm sorry I did that yesterday, but I pray today, now I can do that. And in, the, in a uh, romantic relationship, that would be defined as emotional abuse. Yet somehow, when it comes to sports or religion, those rules don't apply. We moved to Utah when I was six, and I was a huge target of bullying, actually. I was the biggest kid in the entire elementary school as a second grader. I had the big giant hearing aids over the ears, and I talked I talk like a top possible. I don't know how top people I talk all us. We talk in the back of the throat because you feel that reverberation up into your skull. So you feel like you're making a sound. And so it wasn't until I got this, when I turned 16 that I got digital hearing aids that I realized, oh, I started to hear the distinction, the foreground of, okay, that's where, that's where the party is, up in the front of the mouth, not in the back of the mouth. So digital is a great age to have hearing loss. Analog was just blast as sound. But as a kid, I've always made people uncomfortable. There were no amenities to learn sign language in a polygamous commune. I had to learn to be thrown into the fire every day, pushed outside my comfort zone to learn to speak, practice speech therapy, and make people uncomfortable along the way. Because when you talk like loss, like a daft person, everyone thinks you're an idiot. Or you can talk like this and everyone thinks you're a jerk when you don't respond to them. You can't win. So even from the youngest age, I've been on the fringes making people uncomfortable. Is, I guess is part of my nature and part of me enjoys it. I'm a competitive person. I like proving people wrong. That's a nasty habit. But I was a huge target of bullying. I actually dealt with suicidal depression when I was a kid. Because when we moved to Utah, the all red name was still very synonymous with polygamy. And if there's one thing a Mormon doesn't like, it's a polygamous Mormon. <laughs> How dare you remind us of our 19th century history. <laughs> Go away. Leave us to our Whiggish, perfect, pristine propaganda that is very clear. That's how they like it, because it's simple. It's easy. And they, as a young boy, I started to learn how to do this to overcome my suicidal depression. When bullies would come at me and they would taunt me, take, try to take the hearing aids out and throw them into the bushes, instead of me reacting and shrinking my size, I began to stare at them and ask a question. 
What is going on in their home life that is so bad that they have to come after me to try to make me feel worthless? Maybe their dad beats them. Maybe their mom doesn't care about them. This is called compassion. Compassion protects you. What? It does. It gets you outside of your head. And you realize that when people are projecting onto you, they're judging you, it really has nothing to do with you. If there's one thing I've learned in my travels around the world, playing 10 years on every continent, is that the label that people judge you with is very much the same label they are terrified of being labeled themselves. Oh, he's so lazy. I hope no one calls me lazy. Another less, you know, sex shaming and everything like that. People are so afraid that they will be judged as something that they then will project it onto other people. And so I have learned this fundamental truth that people operate in two modes fear or trust slash love. 90% of the world operates in fear. Fear that they'll never be good enough. Fear that they'll be isolated, ostracized from their community. Fear that they will be abandoned. Fear that they won't have value. Fear that they will lose power. My parents actually blew the whistle on the all rare group, and my father was the, the heir apparent. And he discovered their child abuse from several of our prophets in the community. And we actually went into hiding. And even though many people had trusted my father before, they could not let go of the idea that they were special, that they were God's chosen people, that they had the one true church, that rule and all of it was martyred, he was assassinated because we were the chosen people. That was our merit badge. They had given 40, 50 years of their life to the All Red Group. If they leave now, what was it all for? And so they had to hold on to that merit badge, those stories, even if they're causing them pain, because that's who they believe they are, their identity. And so I learned as a young boy, again, fear, the organized religion for many is mostly psychological. Nothing to do with spirituality. But a fear that, okay, if I don't do this, I might go to hell. But a lot of them is a more superficial fear of, I might be isolated. My family will disown me. Luckily, at this time, as we transitioned out, I began playing basketball, eighth grade. I grew that year. I didn't play organized basketball before then. Very clumsy long, gangly, my gross motor skills were atrocious, but my fine motor skills, off the hook. <laughs> I will destroy any one of you here at Street Fighter 2. <laughs> Mario Kart, you're done. Don't even try. It's over. My inner ear imbalance was pretty atrocious. I had the coordination of a drunk kid. But I, was about, I grew from 5'10 to 6'4", my eighth grade year at Bryant Junior High. Basketball coach sees me walking down the hall, says, hey, you should come play basketball. I'm like, okay, yeah, I don't have any friends, let's give it a shot. I don't have to worry about communicating with anybody. Little did I know, team sports requires extreme amounts of communication. And I began to love it because a sense of community, a team. I lost all my cousins who had been my best friends. And then my parents were going through a lawsuit by his own brother and his own mother. My father was being sued for a home to make an example of us. It really wasn't about the money. Even though we won the lawsuit, we didn't get lawyer fees. So my parents were hamstrung with $150,000 in debt trying to escape polygamy. And just let everyone else know, too, if you try to leave, we won't make it easy for you. Basketball was a beautiful segue, but I will tell you this honest truth, this story. Even though you're leaving a thing like polygamy, I had this story that 
I still had to earn God's love, that I was being punished for some past sin that I had no recollection of. And I truly believe that I had to be the first death player in NBA history, and then I'd be worthy of love, and God would be proud of me. That's the kind of pressure I put on myself as a kid playing basketball. My parents didn't need, didn't need to wake me up because I was afraid of hell. And we're going to talk about this in context, but like every made or missed shot truly had eternal ramifications in my mind. And so I put that kind of pressure on myself, and that's why I woke up every morning at 5 a.m. before school and biked through rain, sleet, or snow and went and practiced. But I also started writing down my goals, and I put them above my lights, which is my sister's a great story. My oldest sister said, I want to be a medical doctor. In a polygamous commune in 1980, I want to be a medical doctor. And everyone says, no, that's not important. Women don't get educations, let alone become medical doctors. And my sister said, watch me. And she, when she saw how much I was loving basketball, she was currently at the University of Utah Medical School. She said, Lance, here's what you do. You write down your goals, you put them above your light switch. And every time you touch your light switch, you read it out loud three times. Maybe a little OCD, <laughs> just maybe. But every goal I have written down and read faithfully has come true in some way, shape, or form. Did it look like it was going with what I thought it was going to look like? Absolutely not. But they have come true. On that first goal sheet was, I want to play basketball at the University of Utah. It was a powerhouse program, and there was Coach Majerus there. And of course, I was drawn to Coach Rick Majerus because I grew up in a world where my grandfather and my Uncle Owen were prophets of God, and they were going to get me to heaven. But I don't have that anymore. But oh, Rick Majerus, a large, magnanimous man, so gregarious, is going to get me to the NBA. And then I'll get to heaven. I didn't know actually how to be a leader of my own life. I, like many of us, have been taught to attach my self-worth to an outcome, to an achievement or a benchmark, and then I'll have value to give to the world. At the University of Utah, it was a great fit. And I tell these stories not, and you'll see, I'm going to come back to all of them, not to anger or speak ill of the dead, but so that we learn from them. Sophomore year at the University of Utah with Coach Majerus, and I couldn't play basketball with my hearing aids in due to sweat and concussion issues. I had to learn to always keep my head on the swivel and watch people's body language and memorize plays quickly and get to the spot where I needed to be. And at my sophomore year at the University of Utah, Coach Majerus was having a rough day and he was cussing us out. And it was January 6, 2002, my mother's birthday. I had called her to tell her happy birthday before practice. And Majerus has us on the baseline. He's cussing us out. And he says, Lance, you know, you're the worst of all. You use your hearing as an excuse to weasel your way through life, and you're just a disgrace to cripples. And that broke me because I had given everything I could to this man. But I was that kid in seminary that was always asking tough questions. Why is this new convert kid asking all things about D and C section 123 and everything like that? It's like, man. <laughs> but I was, the, I was on a seminary council presidency at East High School. And then I decided I don't want to go on a mission. Oh, the horror. <laughs> Rumors came out that I had gotten someone pregnant that's why I couldn't go on a mission. Funny, though, because I was a virgin until I was 25. <laughs> because no one would date me. I only date return missionaries. I don't care what your heart is, if you're a good person. I need to know that you're going through all the hoops, building up the perfect resume, so that my family looks like the perfect family. So, what I'm getting at, even if you lost two years, or you took my path, it's hell getting out. When you have that kind of societal pressures telling you what you have to have to do or your worth is attached to them. There's no easy way out. It's painful. 
it's hard. And most people will do anything they can to avoid self-reflection, introspection, and growth because it requires accountability, ownership of your choices, ownership of your decisions. After I left Utah, I went to Weber. A great time at Weber. I loved Weber. And then I went to, after that, I went to play overseas in Turkey, Istanbul. $100,000 contract as a rookie, thinking, oh, this is going to be great, awesome. But we were doing too well. It's number two in the league, and the coach and the owner, who didn't play basketball, they thought, oh, we're number two in the league, and our center is only a rookie. Imagine if we brought in a more experienced center. We go from number two to number one. There's a guy over in Afghanistan averaging 42 points a game. Let's bring him over. Afghanistan? And they think these numbers are going to add up. And so, for anyone who wishes their child was a professional athlete, be careful what you wish upon your children. To be viewed as cattle, a commodity, you're a number. People don't care about your feelings. Bleed, sweat, die if you have to, but entertain me. Give me distractions from my own life so just for a minute I can forget all of my standards or values and just project. And so when I was a weaver, keeping this vein, when I actually finally told the truth about what went on at the University of Utah because rumors had built and Gordon Monson came and talked to me, I had a choice to keep quiet. But for my parents' example, I've never given much credence to the code of silence. And even to this day, I still get hate mail messages from fans for bringing down the Rick Majerus program. Because he resigned a week after that article came out in 2003, 2004. But it wasn't so much me trying to vindictively bring down Rick Majerus. It was me realizing that when I helped him recruit other kids to the program, I had actually lied to their parents and said, oh, yeah, this is a good place to come. You're going to be taken well care of. So in order for me to own and ameliorate my weakness of not being able to tell the truth, I had an opportunity to make it right. And these are hard choices. And most people choose easy. But even when those fans in those arenas all across the world are dumping on you and projecting on you, and Utahns are some of the most vicious fans in the world. Why? Because we're taught to always walk around with a happy smile on our face. Everything is amazing. We live in the best place in the world. We don't have any problems. We don't talk about them. But then finally, oh my gosh, I can just vent and get all this off my chest. And then they label you, they judge you, they throw stones at you, and they think they know you. But they don't. And you realize it's just their own fear. They're projecting onto you. That team in Turkey, when the coach and the owner are deciding, hey, Lance, we're going to let you go because you're a freshman, we want you to play somewhere else and get better playing time somewhere. And I'm thinking, okay, yeah, well, you still owe me $100,000, uh, but hey, I'll take, you still, I'll take the first 20000 that you owe me for the first month that you haven't paid. They're like, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll mail it to you. I'm like, like hell, are you going to mail it to me? <laughs> I want my wire transfer receipt before I jump on this plane. And they said, okay, fine, go ahead, meet the team trainer, Tonight at 6 p.m., before the Ramadan bell, uh, behind the Grand Mosque, the Blue Mosque at the Grand Bazaar. And I'm thinking, uh, sounds ominous, but let's do it, okay. Luckily, my brother was with me. And so he and I, these big giant towheads, walking through the Grand Bazaar, think like Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark. And 
sea of turbans or dark hair and rug salesmen everywhere. Hey, American, you want a rug? No, I don't want a rug. I just want my paycheck and I want to get out of here. We walk through this crowd of people and I finally find the teen trainer and he walks up, figuring out his way, and out of his envelope, out of pocket, he takes an envelope and opens it up, $20,000 cash. And I'm like, whoa, I don't want that. He just shrugs, drops it on the ground, and walks away. Like, okay, well, uh, and everyone, and these two total mafia-looking guys, but like everyone in the whole bazaar just knew, like, that's $20,000. It's like they just knew $20,000. So I picked it up. My brother and I do a bait and switch. He takes the envelope. I take the cash. We split up, and I start walking down the back streets of Istanbul, and one of the guys starts following me. The other one starts following my brother, and I pick up the pace. He picks up his pace. I start jogging. He starts jogging, and I'm doing a dead sprint down the back alley of Istanbul. The Ramadan bells are screaming, and I'm thinking, I don't know what this is. Like, a Jason Bourne movie? <laughs> I thought I was a professional basketball player. So I had to scale the cement wall, hit out next to a chicken coop until it got dark and I finally made, made my way home. So my very first 20K marathon was of a different sort. <laughs> I then went to Italy, uh, Spain and injured my knee in Spain. Team there said that was a pre-existing condition. So I had to go home for my first year a professional basketball, paying for my own knee surgery, broke, in debt, in the red, rehabbing on my parents' sofa. And here's how low it was, guys. In three weeks of rehab, I read all the Harry Potter books. <laughs> and I'm thinking, where, I thought I was a professional athlete. Where is my Cadillac with the spinning rims, yo? Where's my diamond grill and my Bose headphones? Why, oh why, am I reading all the Harry Potter books? I don't know. I only got one job that next year. That was to go play for the Idaho Stampede up in Boise, Idaho. And now that I got that job, turns out to be the media guy. The token guy at the end of the bench they think that thought wasn't good enough to play. So, there I am, earning this job, still having to try out for this contract that paid. All right. Jason, put you on the spot. How much do you think I got paid a month for that job up in Boise, Idaho, on the minor leagues? 10000 would have been amazing. $900 a month. But don't worry, it's after taxes. Calm down. But I'd already borrowed so much money the year before that I broke my rule of asking for help. And so I wore my same shoes that I wore the year before to tryouts. They were so worn out the first day they ripped off my calluses on both my feet, flayed my skin. Blood was oozing from my shoes. And I had principles of perseverance that I share with people. And one of them is discomfort. How uncomfortable are you willing to be to get what you want out of life? Most people are like, oh, I want all my dreams to come true, but I, I like my comfort zone right here, so I'm just going to wish, because the law of attraction, the secret says, if I wish for something hard enough, it's going to come true. <laughs> no, you can't just wish for a pony, and then a pony is going to appear. The law of attraction to me is this. You set an intention, and the intuition says this is what you have to do to make it come true. And most people will stop, because it's hard. I made that contract after seven straight days of tryouts where the, tr where the trainer had to tape my skin before practice, but they always just ripped off more skin. And I, again, I only got that job, turns out to be the media guy, stressed out beyond reason, had an ulcer and everything. But within later, within March of that year, after I had him play for a stretch of six weeks, starting center broke his leg, starting power forward got bought out, ironically, the same team in Turkey, the one I played for the year before. And he's like, hey, yo, dog, this is a good team. They pay right? I'm like, oh, yeah, they're awesome. I hope it works out for you. <laughs> I was honest. I told him, be careful with the money, but good luck. 
Backup center got recalled to the Seattle Sonics, and so by default, I became the starting center. First game on the road in Bismarck, North Dakota. And I was already in a good mood, because when we were on the road, it meant $30 a day per damn money. So I can actually eat. If I'm feeling risky, I might go buy a $5 footlong from Subway. Feeling kind of bold today, you know, with a bling. So coach sits me down. He's like, okay, Lance, we signed a center. He'll be here tomorrow, but you have to play tonight. And I know you haven't played in six straight weeks, but so just, you know, just be a good teammate, pass the ball, set screens, you know. Just get like four or five points off of offensive rebounds and putbacks. Okay, coach. All right. My first game as a starter on the road, I gave him 30 points and 10 rebounds. So, how did I do that? During those stretch, that stretch of six weeks when I didn't play, when it was practice time, when my teammates were ahead of me on the fast break in scrimmage, that was my game time. So even if they didn't need me, I kept running with them. When they hit the layup, I went one stride further and touched the baseline, and I ran back. And sure, they laughed at me. They thought I was being ridiculous. But I knew I believe in the laws of physics. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. I knew if I kept putting in and putting in, the universe would give me one shot. And when that shot came, hard work doesn't necessarily guarantee our dreams are going to come true. It guarantees us a shot. And when my number was called, I knew I was going to be ready. And shortly after that, I was called up to the Cleveland Cavaliers. It was a great day. It was an amazing day. I had done the impossible, something that people said could never be done. Lanzar is too deaf. He can't do it. My very first game in eighth grade when I played, I was ejected because the ref thought I was ignoring him. People say, yeah, no, he's too deaf to do this. He can't do it. But all my life, people have been telling me what I can and can't do. I simply choose not to listen. Can't hear very well anyway. <laughs> so I walk into the NBA locker room. My locker is right next to LeBron's. And he sees my tattered D-League shoes. And he says, hey, yo, man, what size shoes are you? 15. He goes, good. So am I. Here, take a pair of mine. Granted, he had a whole other locker designated for shoes, but he gave me a pair. That was great. The NBA was everything I hoped it to be, except the one thing I most needed it to be. I remember shooting a free throw in front of 16,000 people, winding up my free throw shot like I'd done a 100,000 times before. And I thought, is this it? Is this the best that it gets? Why don't I feel any different? Why don't I feel that somehow God loves me more or I have more value to give to the world? Because again, I did not know how to be a leader of my own life. I was attaching my self-worth to an outcome. Needless to say, severe disenchantment, even depression hit me. I was there at the NBA, but I had to go on medication for depression. And then the economy hit, 2008. That next fall, and most teams release their 13th or 14th, 15th roster spots to save money, and I was no exception. The day before my massive guarantee kicked in of $900,000, I was released. And then I go play basketball around the world, recovering near suicide. I almost jumped out of a window when I was in Italy because I was thinking, what else is there? I did everything I was supposed to do, and I'm not happy. Where's my worth? Where's my value? Where's my happy Hollywood ending? The triumphant kiss at the end of this movie, musical score, in the rain, end roll credits. The movies never show us what happens the day after. So we're taught to chase these unattainable moments of perfection, believing that they will last forever. And even in our religion, they tell us, oh, in heaven, this thing will last forever. And we think, we hold on to it, we endure pain, we endure all sorts of abuse to hold on to these hopes, these stories, because we have this fear that a happily ever after will never come. 
And when people are choosing a different path, it makes us uncomfortable. And they project onto you. But I still have one more story after the MBA was gone. Oh, but I'll get married. I'll find someone out there. And then I'll be complete. And then I'll truly be happy. And I'll be validated. And we put unbearable expectations on other people to heal our pain. There was nobody else in that Sunday school room with me except me and the teacher. How could I possibly expect someone else in this world to know what truly happened in that moment and then expect them to take that pain away? What a cruel thing it is to expect people to be more than human. Because again, I did not know how to be a leader of my own life. If you add up the money I'm owed around the world from teams that never paid, not even talking about the Cleveland contract, it's about $900,000. Teams that never paid, that went bankrupt, that folded. And after I was married, I was playing in Mexico with a Mexican passport because my grandfather, Ruland, was born in a Mexican commune in uh, Colonia Dublon, in a Mormon colony down there. So the team in Mexico heard, oh, Lance Allred, his grandfather is a, okay, yeah, I'm now the, the whitest Mexican in the world. <laughs> I have a Mexican passport. And so I'm like, I'm going to take this job because it means job security. Shortly after my son was born, his mother and I were playing in Veracruz, Mexico. And the team there wasn't paying us. And at Christmas time, I had to borrow money from a teammate because my bank card had been eaten up by the ATM. And the team wasn't paying us. I had to borrow money from my teammate. My marriage didn't last much longer after that. I have achieved many things. Expected my self-worth to be found in those achievements. That I would be validated. That I'd be worthy of love. Thank you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I forgive you. I love you. As I look back on this life and these people who have inflicted pain, even when we say, oh, you forgive them, not for them, but for you, you're still holding on to a story. But when you're able to look back on the people that have come and gone through your life, the good ones and the bad ones, the ones that have hurt you along the way, whether they meant, whether they meant to or not, you learn to actually feel this emotion. That when people ask me, Lance, if you could talk to Vic Majerus now, what would you say to him if he were alive? I would say thank you, coach for the path of clarity that you sent me on. Transcending forgiveness, forgiveness to me actually becomes to look like gratitude. Not for the actions that were performed, but for the path of clarity that they set you upon. By learning through their example what unconditional love is not. And there's one thing I've learned on my alchemist journey around the world is that love is either unconditional or it is not love at all. And so Coach Majerus was the perfect person in my life to break down these illusions that I was chasing. Illusions that my self-worth was attached to an outcome. Not that he consciously chose it, but at least subconsciously he was there. And he's the only person that I could have given that much of my agency and my power to. And he was the first perfect person to crush it. And so with that, you learn to feel, again, 
gratitude. And it's hard. Compassion is one of my principles of perseverance that I share all around the world. And it's the hardest one. Knowing that people function from fear. And you realize, again, it's not about you. And you have this gratitude that even those who would truly try to take your agency and try to silence you, when you are in a place of reaction, in anger, knee-jerk reaction, everything that happens, they're still controlling you. Even if you've broken away from an organized religion, but you keep checking in to see what they're doing and you voice your outrage of the day on, online, they're still controlling you. This is something that I've seen and I've watched. And this is also why, I don't want to get all political, but why Donald Trump has so much power. Because everyone's freaking out every day about the new thing that he's doing that eventually it becomes the boy who cried wolf. I'm not saying you let things slide. If you remember there a couple of years ago, I wrote an article with the Salt Lake Tribune when the LDS church came out with a policy for, against children of gay people, saying that children of, just as we do with children of uh, polygamy, we now do with children of gay people. They can't be baptized using polygamous kids basically as the, base, as the vindication for their intolerance. You pick your battles when it's time to speak up. You wait patiently and you pick your battles and when you do speak up, it has leverage. It has power. But when you're constantly in a reaction mode, not in a grounded space of presence and acceptance, your, your words lose their weight. And this is hard work. It is. If it was easy, everyone would do it. And here's the thing about emotional intelligence or emotional health. It's such an abstract concept because we're used to trophies and awards and again, merit badges. Mission, baptism, marriage in the temple, awesome, you're a good person, okay, there you go. Emotional intelligence, emotional health, to me looks like this. Accountability. Ownership of your thoughts, your words. Grieving. Learning how to actually grieve. If you've watched my TED Talk, that actually was me going through the grieving cycle. It really wasn't about polygamy. Because where I come from, when someone dies, oh, you smile and say, oh, I'll see them in heaven because any other emotion is a lack of faith. I did not know how to grieve. I did not know how to grieve the loss of my marriage. All I knew how to do was smile and, oh, logic my way through it, oh, it's for the best. Trust me, guys, no one is better at logicking their ways through their feelings than me. And you can try to read and study all you want and have all the data in your head. But grieving requires you to get back inside your body and feel it. And it hurts. We want to study because we're so used to proselytizing. We were taught to do that. So that even when you might be leaving of an organized religion, oh, I got to steady so I have my facts so I can proselytize and let everyone else know all the news. But they're not listening to me. They're not validating all this feelings that I'm having, but I'm trying to process it through logic. And the people you want most to validate you in your life are not going to validate you. It's your job. Sometimes that pain is so overwhelming that it's okay if you say, all right, pain, I can't even breathe today. <sighs> I need you to actually sit down in the chair right next to me. I'm not ignoring you. Just get outside my body. 
sit down next to me and I'll talk to you. But I don't need you up in here in my heart space tearing me up. This is hard work. So when I said these last two years of learning how to grieve, I have to take ownership of my emotions, get back into my space and feel pain. It was harder than making the MBA. I meant it. Oh. But it's not fair. Why is it the ones that were hurt? Why do we have to do all the work? It's like climbing a mountain. The harder your climb, the more setbacks. It takes a long time to get to the top, but that top is high. And when you get there, you can see for thousands of miles. And that's called clarity. Clarity, again, love is either unconditional, it's not love at all. Clarity that most people operate in fear. And it has nothing to do with you. And so, as you go about doing this, I want you to really reflect and understand that many people are going to look at you and say, gosh, well, that seems like a lot of hard work. I don't know why you're doing it. And sometimes I even ask, man, or say, I wish I, life was a lot easier when I had all the answers. Because the more you learn in life, the more you learn how little you know. And even though part of you thinks, oh, I wish I could go back where life was just so simple and black and white. The other part of you knows clarity, you can't put a price on it. And you would never let it go. And even you too, you know too, climbing up this mountain of your own growth, of your own grieving, of your own processing, you know deep in your heart of hearts you were coded to go on this journey. You were coded. And as you work and you breathe and you process it, again, forgiveness begins to look like gratitude. Gratitude to all those millions of people I had played in front of in the world who casted and projected their fear onto me for showing me that so much of the world is fear. And as you work on forgiveness and ascend this mountain, you begin to transcend. And the clarity that you see <clears throat> that people really, what is happening is that they are operating from this fear. And that is how most people do operate in this world. This is hard work, guys. I want you to always, every day, you check yourself and you say, it's a choice. It's a choice to put in the work. It's a choice to be accountable for my thoughts. It's a choice to ask and even rip away the thoughts. Because here's one thing, every culture I played around the world, this is common, this transcends every culture. Everyone and their mother thinks their values are the best values. They do. And so you realize that the human brain is like an empty hard drive. And the culture that you're born in is like the software that was installed into that hard drive. So going back and really stepping behind your thoughts and then analyzing the software of how you process information. And I will always be a recovering Mormon. I will always cast myself immediately process and think, oh gosh, what did I do wrong? How can I fix it? thinking I have control over that. But I don't, I have to catch myself and I have to check it. And I have to see, okay, no, that's not my job. And I have to let go. And you have to actually let people on their path to do what they need to do. 
So choose clarity. And as you think back on all the times that people have hurt you, physically, spiritually, religiously, sexually, again, there's no gratitude for the actions that were performed but there is gratitude for the path that they set you on of clarity. Learning that your self-worth is not attached to these outcomes. This is hard work. It truly is. And some people will say, oh, well, you know, path of least resistance, float downstream, forgive, everything is wonderful, love and light. You still have to be human. You still have to be human. And adversity does, when people say, oh, I don't want any adversity, think about basketball. If I was a basketball player and I said, hey, I want to have the best season of my life, I can't just wish it that I really have to make sure I have the adversity. I have to have the resistance, and that makes me stronger come game time. So, guys, as I'm wrapping up and as I'm saying goodbye, Make sure you keep working on this. Get inside your body. Learn to forgive. And with that true forgiveness comes gratitude. And then you'll be surprised at how much people exit stage entirely. Not just physically, but mentally, emotionally. They exit stage. And you have gratitude for them and you keep ascending, and you keep rising, because you choose to. And as you do this, you're going to keep getting knocked down. That's life. Life will keep knocking you down. But you make me a promise, and you make yourself a promise. But every time you do get knocked down, you get back up one more time. Every single time. And when you do that, you say, thank you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I forgive you. And I love you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>